Pain. Welcome. YouTube's been having some troubles today, I think. So I had to do a from schedule to a live now. But I think it's working now. Okay, so who gets a thousand pine points today? It is Eric S. Nice. One thousand pine points for you. Welcome. Uh, what is the uh, 1042 apologetic? Well, it's a uh, it's an apologetic, and, and basically, I, I want to uh, do this stream for Christians. Um, you atheists, you know, you, you folk, you can still listen to me and hang out here. <laughs> but the goal here is for uh, Christians to outsmart your fellow Christians. So when, you, when you're a, a, a Christian person and you hear another Christian say, oh, there's more evidence for Jesus than X, and fill in the X with your favorite ancient person, you can say, no, that's not true. And then when they look it up later, they can say, oh, wow, you're right. So this is uh, a way for some Christians to, uh, to look really smart. So the, uh, the 1042 apologetic is that there's 42 ancient sources that record um, Jesus within 150 years, within his lifetime, so 30 AD and 150 years about after that, uh, whereas there's only 10 sources for the contemporary Roman Emperor Tiberius, who lived uh, or died around the same time as Jesus. So this should be impressive, right, if this is true, that if you look at from the time of Jesus' death compared to Tiberius' death and go 150 years from that point, and you compare the, what we have, the sources for Jesus to um, this famous Emperor Tiberius, it's 42 for Jesus, 10 for um for tiberius the problem is it's not true now where did this co come from this came from um this guy uh, a dr michael lacona i think it's probably him and a guy named gary habermas which um, i'm going to show a couple of videos from soon 
And um, Michael Lacona says, the Roman Emperor Tiberius was a contemporary of Jesus. The number of non-Christian sources who mention Tiberius within 150 years of his life is equal to the number of non-Christian sources who mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. If we add Christian sources, the Jesus-Tiberius ratio goes from 9 to 9 to at least 42 to 10. In addition, the purpose of writing heavily influences what authors do and do not write about, and they write according to where their interests lead them. Christian writers said very little about the Roman lords, and the Romans said very little about Christians. Moreover, if the early church believed that Jesus' Jesus's eschatological return was imminent, that Jesus would return, we might expect a lack of motivation at that time for writing more on his historical life. So what's Michael Lacona saying at the end here? He's saying that a lot of early Christians truly believe that Jesus was going to return uh, soon. So why bother even writing about it? And so maybe that's why the amount of sources that we have for Jesus is low. But I want to, I just thought of this uh, a few minutes ago when I was going over this stuff. And you know how Christians, apologists, and pastors, they often say that the writings for Jesus are early? And, um, you know, some say 40, 50 AD just 10 years, 20 years after um, Jesus' death. And then you have Paul. If this is true, what Michael Lacona is saying, that if they believe that Jesus' eschatological return was imminent, we might expect a lack of motivation at that time for writing more in his historical life. Why on earth would they write anything in the 10, 20 years during their lifetime about Jesus if they were expecting his return? I think Michael Lacona is right here. I think this is what Michael Lacona is saying here is pretty good evidence that um, the Gospels were written late. When they started to realize, oh, maybe Jesus isn't coming back in our lifetime. Maybe we should start writing some of this stuff down. Okay, I want to um, focus on a guy named Gary Habermas. And I don't know what I should play first. Um, I'm going to go in chronological order. This is from Biola University, September 14th, 2013. And this is him talking about this apologetic, this 1042 apologetic, although he doesn't call it that at this point. So take a listen to what he says. Uh, better data and closer to Jesus' time. Okay. How about Tiberius Caesar? He is the... The Caesar who's on the throne. Octavian is that smart young guy that uh, Julius Caesar, the Julius Caesar, really loved and um, bequeathed everything he had to him. So this, but he wasn't his blood relative, I don't think, at least maybe not close blood relative. So we got a guy named Octavian, and Octavian um, had a daughter, and I think Tiberius married his daughter, and so he became, no, no, his, he married, uh, Octavian married Tiberius's mom. And so uh, Tiberius' stepdad was Octavian. I think that's right. So basically, it's, there's a lot of incestuous <laughs> relationships back then. But basically, that's a relationship between Julius Caesar to Octavian to a guy named uh, Tiberius. We have four major sources for Tiberius and a total of about 10 sources for Tiberius. We have more than 10 sources for Jesus. And you go, yeah, but that's those prejudiced New Testament sources. Okay. More about that in a second. Uh, use the way critics use. We still have more than 10 sources for Jesus. Do you know we have a dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament for Jesus? A dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament that are within 100 to 150 years after Jesus, which is fair in the ancient world. And now when I say 100 to 150, you realize that John's a lot closer than this. But back to Tiberius. We have four sources for Tiberius. One is... Cont okay, I'm just going to say at this point... He's right, there is four sources for Tiberius, but there's a lot, lot more. It's one of those, like, how many women were at the tomb thing. Uh, <laughs> Abramas is not saying that there's only four, but he's just saying that there's four, but there's actually a lot more. Temporary. Go, Whoa, we don't have anything like that for Jesus. But as I'm going to argue tonight, we do. We have sources, so I'm going to spend the rest of my time explaining, that go all the way back to 30 AD. 
So he just said that there's contemporary sources for Tiberius, which is true. But he's saying now that we also have it for Jesus, which is false. You're, you are wrong, Habermas. For Jesus. Okay, so next best source. By the way, the earliest one for Tiberius, the, the historian who, who gives the contemporary data, he's the least useful. The least useful of the four sources. The best source for Tiberius is Tacitus. And Tacitus, if that's Tiberius down there, ground zero, Tacitus, we'd probably be two-thirds of the way up the pews here. Because Tacitus writes, sorry, that's the last guy. Tacitus is going to, if that's John, Tacitus is going to be out here. Tacitus writes about 120 AD. He's plus 80 after Tiberius. Suetonius, plus 85. And Dio Cassius, two-thirds of the way up or further. Dio Cassius is plus 180 from Tiberius. Go, well, okay, I see where you're going, but I have the ultimate objection for you. Okay, so for the people from Alabama, what is he talking about here? He's basically saying that here we got this great Roman leader named uh, Tiberius, and the evidence for Tiberius is actually not that great. It's pretty scant. And when you compare it to Jesus, they're about equal. In fact, if you add Christian sources for Jesus, uh, Jesus kicks butt. It's like 42. The ratio is 42 to 10. Now, um, but the problem with this is Mr. Gary Habermas is, in, is wrong. He's incorrect. And he has a pattern of, um, <laughs> of this. And I want to bring up something that I did a, a while back. And this is, for most of you, you don't care about this, but in the history world, in the ancient history world, um, this was a big deal. And the deal was, there was a rumor going around. No, it wasn't just a rumor. There was people saying, and Gary Habermas was one of them, that we had in our possession a document of Mark, a fragment of Mark, that is dated into the first century, which is a huge deal because um, the earliest before then was in the second century, and it wasn't of Mark, it was of John, I believe. And so here we have this, this fragment of the first gospel dated to the first century. Now, everybody got excited, and however, the problem with this is it wasn't true. It ended up being dated somewhere in the mid-second century, or maybe even later, I forget. And so all this hype of this first century fragment, which would push the, the dating of the Gospels even earlier, was incorrect. But here is uh, my clip of, of Habermas that I did on this first century Mark debacle. Um, and take a listen how confident... Now we. Looking at this point, a lot of uh, other apologists and, and historians were kind of backing off and, and hedging their bets that maybe this isn't a first century, but not Gary Habermas. And to this date, um, he has not apologized for this, whereas other pastors, apologists, and historians have apologized, like Daniel Wallace. Okay, but one paleographer, I don't even think he's a Christian. Um, but you have to be very specialized to be able to date ancient writings by, by handwriting analysis, by the type of handwriting. And the date was just given, I asked permission, could this be, date be given? I was told it could be. He was asked permission, who did you ask and who gave you permission? And the date of this little papyrus from Mark is 80 to 110 AD. So this is February 23rd, 2018, and he's still, uh, Josh McDowell, and seems like he's hedging his bets a little bit, but Gary Habermas is very confident here that uh, that he has it on good authority that he that there's a manuscript existing that's dated between when uh, what did he say eighty and one ten something like that, and we know now looking back he was wrong. He is giving confidence to the students listening to him right now that on things that are untrue. It is earlier than writings for John. So if the fragment for Mark is about the time of John or earlier, now critics are saying 
we're going to have to move the Gospel of Mark back to 40 or 50 A.D. We're going to have to move the Gospel of Mark back to 40 or 50 A.D. Why, why is this such a big deal for these guys? Because they realize that if the Gospels are dated late, um, then basically the game's over. It's, it's basically anybody who could have said anything against the historical data of Jesus is dead. They're just gone. And so if the earlier you can get it towards uh, Jesus' life, the more um, gravitas they have behind this. But the point of me showing this video is that Habermas has a history of, do I say exa exaggerating? No, that's the wrong word. Of just building up confidence on things that he either knows is false or he's just too anxious. No, he's, he's too excited. He's too... Um, does, here's the word. He's too desirous for this stuff to be true, that he'll say things to people who look up to him and say, look, you're a historian. We will just listen to what you have to say. And yet he's flat out wrong about this stuff. Okay. So now I'm going to bring in <laughs> uh, Camille, who's, it's his birthday today. Um, and uh, so happy birthday, Camille. And uh, you're still on mute. Let me get you guys set up. And Cam, who um, is not wearing the, the man bun yet. <laughs> uh, not today. I'm working on it. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, what, did I say anything wrong in the first, uh, in my intro there? Hi, I don't think so. Okay. By the way, it's five, what time is it? It's. 5.51 a.m. there, right? In your bunker in Eastern Europe? Yeah. I had to wake <laughs> up early for this one. <laughs> oh, man. Time zones suck. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, um, I'm going to bring up some slides. And we're going to go through step-by-step step to help Christians get smarter and tell other Christians, because they're not going to listen to us. They're not going to listen to Camille. They're not going to listen to Cam. But maybe there's going to be a few Christians out there who will listen and in the privacy of their own home and uh and take what we have to say and then tell it to other christians to spread the word for us so we're going to talk about um why the 1042 apologetic is incorrect and there we go and oh sorry I, this should be one two three four five but here's the here's the bullet points it's wrong about the literary sources it ignores other sources. It stretches the window of time to skew the results. Remember, it says, uh, you know, 150 years. Habermas said that, and Lycona said that, 150 years. It assumes all sources are equal, and it's flat out wrong and spread by apologists. So we're, let's gonna, we're going to take the first one. And Camille, um, you had some great charts that you made, and I want to bring those up. Um, in fact, you should copyright those charts because <laughs> somebody's going to use them someday and take credit for it. Uh, so here it is. So this is us. Oh, this is Socrates. This is Tiberius. Should I make this big and cover ourselves up? Yeah. Let me do that. So you won't be able to see us. But Camille, why don't you explain uh, what we're looking at here, what the colors represent, and how it applies to what Habermas was saying? Yeah, sure, absolutely. <clears throat> so I just took a timeline of Jesus's life and the timeline of Tiberius. And I basically overlaid the dates of die death because they didn't die uh, the same year. Uh, but basically everything that's dark uh, green was written when the person was still alive. Everything that's light green was written by people who were contemporary, meaning it was written after the person died, but the authors were alive when the person was. Uh, and the red stuff was written by people who were born after the person died. And yellow is unknown because they are, usually it's because they are anonymous. Uh, in this case, because I have the chart for other figures like Caligula and Socrates and stuff like that. Um, in this case, it's just the Gospels. Uh, and it's important to say that this is incomplete. There's much more sources that we have. For example, when you say that there is more evidence for Jesus than for a Roman emperor, you are probably incorrect just because people actually used the uh, years of reigns of Roman emperors to date documents. So when you wrote a letter and you wanted to put down the year in which you wrote it, 
you would say, for example, in the 10th year of the reign of Tiberius. And we have a lot of these letters usually in papyri, right? So I just put one example there that's uh, contemporary with Tiberius, but we have many, many examples of this. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can clearly see that we have actually people mentioning Tiberius when he was almost a teenager, I think in his early 20s, like uh, Nepos or Horace. Uh, because he was a very famous military leader even before he became the emperor. Okay, but uh, Habermas said in the video clip I just played that there's only one contemporary source for Tiberius. How can a guy, yeah, I, how can a professional historian like Habermas be wrong and you right? Yeah, I mean, there obviously has, has to be something going on, right? Um, it could be the case that he, what he wants to say is that there is only one like substantial source, meaning that like someone writing about Tiberius extensively, writing like providing some details about his life and stuff like that, which. I mean, if this is what he means, then it could be the case. But the problem is that you then have to apply the same thing to Jesus, right? But imagine if there was someone who lived at the same time as Jesus, for example, Philo of Alexandria, and just happened to mention Jesus randomly in like one sentence, right? I'm sure at that point, all the apologists would be tripping over themselves, showing how good the historical evidence for Jesus is. And it would be very good, because for a vast majority of people, even religious leaders we don't have contemporary evidence uh, in the ancient world so that could be what's going on or he just didn't do his research yeah so a couple of things one um is to be clear we're not saying that we should expect as much evidence as we have for a roman emperor for jesus so don't uh, nobody make the mistake of thinking that that's what like an argument that's going on here but to be um as charitable to Habermas as possible, maybe he's saying main sources in the sense that they are a historian who writes about the person's life in a biographical form um, where like major events of the person's life is laid out in a chronological order or is related by theme or something like this. And I think that Tacitus, Suetonius and um, the other sources he was identifying probably do fall into that camp. So maybe that's what he means. But the problem is, is that he doesn't make it clear that there is a whole lot of other evidence and we will get to some of that soon. Yeah, I, I'm thinking if there was, like Camille said, if there was just one person who's not a historian, uh, I think Robert uh, Price always bring, uh, brings this up, right? That if there was one businessman who happened to be going through Jerusalem, said, hey, uh, yesterday I saw this guy named Jesus who performed miracles. And, he, and if that was preserved and we found that, guys like Habermas would be putting it on their list here, but, they would, but this is not a historian. And they'd be bragging about it. And um, so how many of these... We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dark greens. So these are people who wrote about Tiberius while Tiberius was alive. We have nothing for Jesus at all. Correct? Yeah, and as I said, there is much more that's contemporary with Tiberius. These are just uh, some examples. And Cam said that we shouldn't expect as many sources for Jesus. That's definitely true if you're talking about a historical Jesus. But if you're talking about the Jesus of the New Testament, I would probably disagree because you have to remember that in the Gospels, he's followed by thousands of people and he performs like public miracles, right? There are some pretty spectacular miracles going on during the crucifixion that you would expect to be recorded. Yeah. That's a good that's a good caveat. We're talking about the critical scholars historical Jesus that we wouldn't expect who was largely a um, unknown person in the first century. Okay, and so we have nothing written uh, while people were alive uh, while Tiberius uh, while Jesus was alive, but we do for Tiberius. And then the light green was basically people who were alive when Tiberius or Jesus were alive and wrote and we only have one for Jesus, and that's Paul, which we have in, the, in uh, the New Testament. And for Tiberius, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six sources, which is also incomplete, Camille? That's right. It yeah, is. Yeah, and 
you know, all Christians always say that there are like pre-Pauline creeds that are preserved inside Pauline letters, and they also count as independent sources. But if you actually have this standard, then we have many more sources for Tiberius. For example, Tacitus um, repl replicates speeches and uh, fragments of letters written by Tiberius himself. So by that standards, we actually have Tiberius's own writing. We don't have like a book that he wrote, but we actually have later historians um, kind of republishing uh, what he wrote uh, when he was alive. And we have many, many more sources that gate date much closer to, for example, when Tacitus uh, wrote, uh, because they are actually cited by Tacitus. Okay, then Suetonius does the same thing as Tacitus yeah, yeah, yeah. records some of Tiberius' own words, apparently. For, for, for example, uh, Suetonius, well, no, actually, it's for Caligula, so uh, never mind. Uh, I want to. Uh, uh, the the people in dark green and light green. Do they put their names on their works? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I think I think most of them. Okay. This is another thing that really bothers me, uh, Christians. If you're listening, this really bothers me. <laughs> when these when I hear, well, everybody did it back then. They they were anonymous. They didn't write put their names on their works. So here we have for Tiberius. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen sources that put their name on their uh, works and say and talk about Tiberius, and we have only one for Jesus, and that's Paul. Uh, if we're talking about people who either uh, were alive when Jesus was alive or um, wrote when Jesus was alive, it, it's just well, we have nothing for Jesus on that. Well, so we're emphasizing a lot here the numbers, and this is like part of the original apologetic. It was a comparison of numbers. But I think that one point that really needs to be stressed, and um, it's it, it cuts both ways, that we don't consider number of sources to be the most pertinent thing when considering what uh, value a source has for uh, historical events or a historical person. Um, and that's because there are other factors that historians consider more relevant than simply numbers. So for example, you could have a, a text that's written about somebody who doesn't exist or a text that's written uh, narrating event that didn't happen. And that can get repeated because of the fact that it's believed hundreds of times and that could inflate a uh, very large statistic when you're just doing source counting but what we really care about is the the type of content that is preserved in a source and factors that would make that content uh, uh, more expected if it is the case that the person really existed and did what is said um, on comparison with other hypotheses yeah you're talking about not just quantity but quality of work and this is why I'm bringing up this slide. Camille, this is yours, right? Is this Dionysius talking about uh, Gaius Caesar? No, this is Suetonius talking about What's Caligula. It, it doesn't actually say Caligula because it wasn't his name. Uh, but yeah, this is basically the opening of the biography. And it's great because it shows you how an ancient historian talks about his sources and evaluates them critically. So every basically underlined name is a different source that he's bringing up just to clear up when and where Caligula was actually born. And we have sources like the Gazette, which was basically newspapers, uh, because in Rome at the time they already had newspapers. So by the standard that a Christian would use to say that we have pre-Pauline creeds, because they are preserved in Paul, for Caligula we have newspapers from when he was born, uh, preserved in Suetonius, and I think it's it's pretty extraordinary. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Luke is always espoused as the best uh, gospel historian, but Luke doesn't even come close to being as specific as Suetonius here. Yeah, I, basically all the, th all the passages that uh, people bring up when they say that Luke is a good historian, it's basically an intro it, like the introductory paragraph, uh, would fit inside just this one section where Suetonius talks about when and where Caligula is born. 
But you have to remember that as ancient historians go, Suetonius is actually considered to be pretty unreliable. Uh, because, for example, he tends to repeat a lot of gossip that probably wasn't true. There was just things that people said about emperors because they were considered like celebrities at the time so a lot of gossip about their sexual immorality and stuff like that and also historians today think that Suetonius probably had some political agenda that motivated him to report things that were being circulated but were probably not true like for, for a lot of the kind of the stereotypes about the Roman emperors, like Caligula being insane, uh, Claudius being basically m mentally retarded, and then uh, Nero being this like vain artist came primarily from Stonius. But if you actually look up, look at earlier sources for these figures, you don't see that kind of characterization there. Well, also um, relevant to Tiberius, isn't it Suetonius who reports uh, his debauchery on Capri? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that goes back to him. I mean, Suetonius, uh, um, Tiberius gets a pretty bad rap in uh, Tacitus as well, but not nearly as bad. What kind of debauchery? So <laughs> like uh, having sex with men and throwing them off this giant cliff. If well, I remember correctly. having sex with babies, with infants. Uh, oh, right. That's pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just did want to mention one book. Uh, if you read like any particular book on Roman historians or Greek and Roman historians, I would pick up um, Michael Grant's uh, Greek and Roman historians. Uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, information and misinformation. And what this book does is it goes through um, a variety of different examples of like bad historiography in what are effectively the best uh, historians of the time um, to indicate how like even those people who were better at it uh, get things wrong and are driven by various biases and et cetera. So if you're a Christian listening and you hear another Christian say there's uh, just as much evidence or more evidence for Jesus than other ancient historians, um, I want you to remember this. You can use these charts or go to this video and, uh, and you can show, no, this is not true. And you, have, you did this for Socrates compared to Jesus. Why don't you go through this one, Camille? Yeah, so Socrates obviously lived much earlier uh, than either Tiberius or Jesus, so it's, we don't have uh, that much, many sources as we do from the first century. Because the first century, you have to remember, was one of the golden ages of literature in the ancient world, and we actually have a lot of sources preserved. But for, for Socrates, which in some cases people even doubt his historicity, um, we have actually not only the sources that obviously were written by people who knew him, like Plato and Xenophon, who both wrote his... Uh, like. Uh, they basically wrote a fictional version of the defense speech that Socrates gave when he was on trial for atheism, basically, uh, for, for corrupting the youth. And we even have Aristophanes, his comedy, The Cloud, where um, Socrates is the main character. And it was performed when, uh, uh, when Socrates was still alive. We, there is even a source saying that Socrates attended the, the play. So um, if we had the same evidence for Jesus, we would have a play written by someone who knew Jesus, because Socrates and Aristophanes both live in Athens and they knew each other. And we would have a later source, for example, Paul, saying that Jesus attended the, the, the play. Uh, we obviously don't have that. So even though the first century was like a, the, a great century for writing stuff, we have here in the 4th century BCE, 400 years before this, better evidence for Socrates than Jesus, or more sources. I mean, but to, to play devil's advocate once again, um, if it is the case that Jesus was this uh, itinerant preacher in an area that had very low literacy rates um, and his primary uh, followers, the disciples, were illiterate fishermen and, you know, tax collectors and things like this, um, we wouldn't really expect um, to see them writing things about him like we see people writing about Socrates. But he, he healed the sick. He brought the dead back to life, Cam. 
Right, and so that's like on the the Christ of faith. Yes, we would definitely. You can't separate the Christ of faith from the historical Jesus, can you? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go for the Clark Kent and not the Superman. <laughs> yeah, you you have to remember that we actually have a lot of people attested in the first century Palestine, like really obscure Jewish religious leaders and uh, rebel leaders and stuff like that, where almost nobody talks about them. And they were like on the similar level of notoriety as the Jesus of faith, uh, sorry, as the Jesus of history. And in some cases, it was even bordering the Jesus of faith. For example, the Egyptian that you know from uh, the book of Acts that we don't e even know what his name was. Josephus just casually mentions that he gathered a following of 30,000 people and he led them somewhere before they were massacred by the Romans. So he was pretty influential figure at the time, but he's only mentioned in Josephus and Acts, as far as I know. Okay, this is a, um, a timeline of specific events in two people's lives. On the left is Jesus, on the right is Tiberius. And this is uh, done by Matthew Ferguson, right? This is not yours, right, Camille? So, yeah, yeah, this is just copied from him, correct. So, oh, and we should, we should point out that uh, Matthew Ferguson, he's a uh, classicist doing his doctoral studies. He um, wrote a blog article that was addressing specifically the 1042 apologetic. And while, like, Camille and I and Doug have, like, done a lot of investigating of this stuff ourselves, he did an absolutely excellent job of uh, cataloging a lot of the evidence for Tiberius and um, in particular showing the areas where this 1042 apologetic um, is invalid. Yeah, and for Christians listening, there's a debate uh, or conversation on Unbelievable, I think, between him and uh, Craig Evans, right? Uh, you remember that, Cam? And I think Craig yeah. Evans really uh, liked Matthew Ferguson, he's a very likable guy, um, so uh, you can go to him as a source, as a Christian, and uh, not feel like he's just going to mock you, <laughs> attack you. Um, so uh, the main point of this, Camille, is to show that when it comes to specific events throughout the life of an individual, uh, we know a lot about Jesus' ministry because of the Gospels, but from Jesus's birth to the point of his ministry, we almost know nothing. Yeah, this, this is more like to, to address the point that, yeah, we have like an inscription basically mentioning Tiberius's name, but maybe we don't have that much details about his life compared to Jesus, right? But this just shows the events where we can put a, a precise date uh, to it. And so in some cases, we even know the exact day not only not not the year right not just the year um so this just shows that this isn't correct and again you would expect to see that if you're talking about the roman emperor who even before he became emperor in like i think in his 40s or 50s who had very distinguished military careers like these are exactly the type of people who are mentioned in ancient sources in great detail so you would expect that that's why if you hear someone saying something like that, that Jesus was basically, is better attested than people like that. You, you, there should be immediately red flags because like, if you think about it for two minutes, that's not what you, what you would expect. Um, okay, so let's move on. It is wrong because of the literary sources, we just showed a whole bunch of literary sources for um, Tiberius and compared to Jesus, not only in quantity, but in quality is better. And the second main uh, point against this apologetic is that it ignores other sources. And so, Cam, this is, um, I'll move it over to you. There's a ton of sources that we have that are not literary. And so, for example, what are we looking at here? This is non-literary source or evidence for Tiberius, I think, right? You're I again. think this is you, Camille. Yeah, sure. So this is actually Caligula. Uh, this is a tomb, tombstone on a tombstone of his mother. So the archaeological evidence is is there. If you like, again, this is something what you would expect. Like for example, for Caligula, we have uh, an amphitheater uh, that he built. It was later demolished, 
and it was actually excavated. So we have buildings, for example, that were built by these emperors that were later found. We even have inscriptions mentioning that these buildings existed. Uh, we have houses that these people <laughs> lived in, right? Like, imagine if uh, the archaeologists today actually found Peter's house in Capernaum. That would be huge. Like, everyone would be all over <laughs> it. But, so yeah. Doug, if you go back, I can talk about some of these. I, th I think it's just that you put a Caligula inscription up. Um, if you're wanting to put a Tib Tiberius one, you could put up the um, Rescepti one um, or the Deeds it. of Divine. Yeah, that one. Okay, so this one here, this was actually something that was written uh, mostly by Augustus, um, Tiberius's stepfather, and he left it in his will such that upon his death, it would be uh, inscribed on bronze uh, columns to give effectively propaganda for all of the things that Augustus did for the Roman Empire. Um, it gives his deeds and how he paid money out of his own pocket, etc. And in this document um, that was copied onto other um, inscription, like other tablets, for example, other than these bronze columns, uh, it mentions Tiberius a couple of times um, and effectively acknowledges him as a stepson and, and yeah. And this is from Tiberius's life while he was still alive, because this was published when his father or stepfather died. Yeah. So when guys like Habermas talk about not only they're wrong about the quantity and probably even quality of Jesus compared to other ancient figures, they're totally ignoring all this other stuff like inscriptions. And like, is it true that Tiberius actually kind of looked like that? <laughs> Yeah, so this one's interesting. So with respect to uh, portraits or busts of Tiberius, uh, what uh, art historians know is that there were these particular style types that were used in um, the official like artists of the like imperial court. And what we find is that there are early busts that were created of Tiberius that use a lot of the same style types as what were being used for Augustus at the end of his reign before he died. And so we see like these commonalities between the busts. And we also see um, over time the depiction of Tiberius in a variety of busts changing. In particular, he gets depicted uh, quite youthfully, even when he was quite old. Um, and he uh, then begins to eventually be depicted slightly older. But they it's it's uh artistic <laughs> it's aesthetic but he broadly looked like that and he was known for known for having particular facial features and those facial features actually get preserved as well on some coins which we will see soon don't we have the shroud of turin <laughs> for jesus yeah, well, uh, this is interesting because, it, okay, perhaps it is the case that we have the Shroud of, T Shroud of Turin, but the thing is, is that there is so much more debate over something like that. I mean, I, of course, come down on the side of thinking that it's not at all authentic, um, even that it contradicts with the Gospel of John. But in the case of Tiberius, the particular things that we have depicting him, the physical artifacts from his life, we actually have very high confidence in their provenance. Okay, so these are the Tiberius Denarius coins. So what's fascinating about this one is that uh, you may have noticed that on Camille's earlier slide, he actually put uh, the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Luke, um, because what we find is that the Gospels, because of the fact that Jesus is set in 30 AD, um, it actually they actually make mention to Caesar or in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John, even specifically to Tiberius, um, or John at least mentions Lake Tiberius. But with Mark, there is the story in Mark 12, where um, in a discussion about like, uh, about uh, Rome, effectively, uh, Jesus is uh, given a coin and looks at a coin and he says, like, does this coin not bear the likeness of Caesar? 
and the Caesar that we know that he's talking about is Tiberius. And then he says the famous line, or oh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. So if it is the case that this Mark Markin story is actually authentic, Jesus in his lifetime was literally looking at a coin that had Tiberius's face on it. <laughs> Um, and I find that really uh, quite quite amusing. What's the um, what's this part? Is that a god? So that is a depiction of Pax or peace, and uh, in particular, uh, like these nuministic historians, like these people who are experts in coins, they think specifically that this is actually meant to depict. Uh, depict Livia, Tiberius's mother, but it's actually like the symbol of peace. And on uh, the on the left hand side there, you have um, Maxim, Maxima or Maximum, I think, and then on the right hand side you have Pontiff, and that's uh, Pontiff Maxima. It's like the the highest uh, high priest of office of the imperial cult. And doesn't doesn't it say Augustus Divi? What does Divi mean in Latin, Cam? Yeah, so on the on the face of it, yeah, it does. It says Augustus uh, Divi, and it, it would actually says Tiberius as well, but it doesn't say um, Tiberius's full name. It uses this convention where it's shortened down, so it says something more like uh, T Caesar, I think it is. Um, but yeah, the Augustus Divi means like you know uh, Augustus god like the divine augustus so jesus was looking one savior was looking at the coin of another savior <laughs> yeah well according to for example the priene calendar inscription uh augustus uh was actually considered you know the good news to the roman empire and he was considered the so the savior the soter of the roman people um so yeah one savior to another and so this is just the same effectively, but it's a gold coin. It actually has pretty much the same content on it. Um, it's just a higher quality. Uh, this here is uh, what happened is uh, later in um, Tiberius's years, there was like a lot of conspiracy that he was being fed by this figure named Sejanus and uh, conspiracy that uh, Tiberius was going to like maybe be harmed or killed or something like that if he stayed in Rome. And so he actually eventually um, isolated himself on this island of Capri and uh, continued on in Augustus's tradition of building uh, buildings on Capri. And in particular, he uh, appears to have built um, uh, this is like we we get references of it from later historians, but then archaeology seems to bear out the same claims of this place called uh, the you know Villa of of Jupiter, effectively, which was Tiberius's home for many years on Capri, and um, w was effectively the place that he lived for many years. And it's huge. What you see there at the top is actually a church. It's a modern building, but the lower parts are all the ruins of the original villa. So. Habermas is saying the evidence for Jesus is as good as the, or the sources of Jesus is as good as for Tiberius, but we actually know Tiberius's house. And we also know that he had a big nose. <laughs> At least it looks like he has a big nose. Here the nose is chopped off, I guess. What's this house? So this one here was a temple um, to Augustus, like the divine Augustus. And so this um, is in this area in Rome, um, which a, a whole bunch of like Roman, like, uh, imperial buildings were built and uh, it looks as though either Livia or most probably Tiberius completed the um, the construction of this tempest temple to the divine Augustus but did they sign it or how like how do we know that uh, there may be inscriptions surviving from it but um, did, I'm did Tiberius honest, put I'm his totally hands sure. handprints into the wall or something <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. I don't think so, though. What are we looking at here? So, so this one's interesting. So this is like a, a judgment from the Senate during the time of Tiberius's life that Tiberius actually weighs in on. And in particular, it's because of some um, 
like it's like a judicial thing effectively where somebody um is on trial and it makes mention directly to tiberius as caesar at the time okay if i remember if i remember correctly so not only oh, here we are here we are. I can read a little bit of it. Uh, whereas Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the deified Augustus Pon Pontifex Maximus, in the twenty-second year of his uh, tribun tribunician power, uh, having been consul three times, consul designate for the fourth time, referred to the Senate for decision, and then it goes on to give like a description of the case. Okay, so not only uh, are there much fewer sources for Jesus, um, but for Jesus we have none of the stuff that we are talking about here. No busts, no inscriptions, no tombstones, no homes, no nothing. We have no hard physical evidence. Um, this third point is something that um, Matthew Ferguson brought up, and I thought it was good, and it... And that is that this 1042 apologetic, it stretches the window of time to skew the results. In other words, why would guys like, like Kona and Habermas use 150 years as opposed to 75 years or 100 years or 300 years? Um, what's your guess on that? And I want to bring up um, Camille's nice chart. Yeah, Camille, do you want to um, weigh in on that? Like, what would happen? For sure. Can... Yeah, go ahead, Camille. Yeah, because they get more sources for Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's probably the only reason, right? And I mean, and again, uh, first of all, we are not saying that this is true, therefore Jesus didn't exist as a historical person, right? That would be insane. Because as I said, we have a lot of examples of people who are roughly similar to Jesus in that they were Jewish leaders in the first century Palestine. And they are recorded just in Josephus very briefly, but we still think that they existed, right? Uh, so this is not the case. Uh, but, uh, and it's also not that important, like how long the source is after the person died. I think this is, gets over overemphasized. Like you, you can get reasonably good quality of the evidence, uh, even if it's very late, you have to look at uh, like the nature of the source. That's much more important. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, they are probably just playing a numbers game basically. Okay, Camille, when you made your chart, uh, you went about a hundred years after the deaths of of Tiberius and Jesus, it looks like. Yeah, it's it's just uh, we have so many early good quality sources, then I think this is sufficient. Because if you find someone who's mentioning the person when the person was still alive, you then don't have to go 150 years after that. But if, right? you were, like you're but, better. But if we were to expand this out another 50 years or so, would Jesus now overtake Tiberius? I don't think so. Uh, definitely, if not, if you're going by like mutually independent sources, which is a whole other debate. Because for Jesus, we would start getting uh, literature uh, writers, which there are some, but it's not a massive number, especially not the very early ones. But also, they are dependent on the Gospels, obviously. Like they didn't know Jesus personally or anything like that. Uh, the only other guy who would maybe qualify it is Papias, because he supposedly preserves some sayings of Jesus that were not uh, that are not included anywhere else. So he would maybe count as independent source. Yep. And he mentions his sources, unlike the Gospels. So if Papias says that he knew a guy named John. And that was his source. I'm wondering why the Gospels don't do the same. So, uh, but it's just a, but just a, an aside. If you're a Christian listening and you really want to have fun, um, and if you ever ever in a, are in a room in a presentation of uh, Habermas or Lycona, and they bring up anything related to this about sources for Jesus compared to other ancient figures, you can get like a like a million. No, not a million. I, I better be careful. I don't want to give out a free uh, trip to Vegas. <laughs> You'll get 10,000 pine points <laughs> from me. <laughs> if you ask this question to like Kona or Habermas, what if we were to make that 150 years or so after Jesus down to 50 or 75? How would it compare? How would Jesus compare to Tiberius? And see what they say. 
In fact, they're going to go, well, um, um, uh, well, they're going to stutter. And they're going to, well, we haven't really crunched the numbers on that one. But in, in general, whenever an apologist uh, or a historian mentions numbers, ask what happens if those numbers were to change. What does, test, test those numbers out and see how they respond. Cam, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of thoughts. Like, yeah, the like as Camille said, the the stretching just really does seem to be a way to inflate inflate the statistic, even though the statistic that they give in the book is actually wrong when you actually look at the sources for Tiberius. Um, but I do want to note that Lo Lycona did actually publish a a blog post entitled "Humble Pie," where he does admit that. Uh, the work of Matthew Ferguson makes him aware of sources that he wasn't aware of prior. Of. But my issue, and perhaps we'll get into this a little bit later, is that I don't think that simply saying that is sufficient to overcome the fact that you effectively launched an apologetic that I still hear repeated by Christians to this day on a fairly regular basis. That's a great point, Cam, and I got it here. This is from Matthew Ferguson's blog, and I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, this is Matthew Ferguson claiming that uh, well, he first mentions this guy named Cliff uh, Knickle. Um I actually uh, interacted with this guy at the University of Arizona because he, uh, he does a lot of uh, talks there. But he, uh, Matthew Ferguson says that Mike Lacona has admitted that the 1042 apologetic is wrong. Here it is. Um, but since Lycona has acknowledged that making errors with the same statistic in the case for the resurrection of Jesus, his statement about the sources for Tiberius versus Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus uh, can be considered likewise conceded. Gary Habermas, the other co-author, also cites the 1042 apologetic in the resurrected. Um, yeah, so it's not clear to me if Gary Habermas has conceded that this apologetic is faulty. Yeah, well, I, I do know that Gary Habermas still uses the one with respect to Alexander, which I also think is wrong, um, which perhaps Camille will get into later with one of his fancy charts, beautiful charts. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think that Lycona, like I really plead with you, make go spend two weeks or something like that and write a really excellent article on our sources for Tiberius and help clear out this rubbish apologetic that's floating around in Christian circles and misleading the public about our sources for Roman emperors. Like, I mean, I don't have any particular, like, I, I don't love Tiberius or anything like that, but to me, it's a bit of an issue that there are these public lies out there that could be easily corrected with a small amount of work by somebody who has the authority that you have. Yeah, I think that the reason why we're talking about it is because we just happened to come across another person, uh, like a Christian who was peddling this. So we thought we might do uh, a, a video, right? Because even though the some of the originators of this have apologized, basically, the ma the damage is already massive, right? So it's it takes much more time to correct uh, yeah. this information than to spread it. Uh, yeah. And I and it's it's not it's not just sorry it's just, not just Lacona and Habermas. There are many other apologists who are kind of doing the same thing. For example, there, it's very unfortunate, but there there is an email that was sent by Inspiring Philosophy to N.T. Wright, who is uh, slight, a very good scholar. Slight correction there. It was yeah. sent by somebody who uh, Inspiring Philosophy knows. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but, but he it was by him. But he yeah. published. Yeah. yeah. There you go. This is how you you get to confusion in ancient sources. Uh, yeah, but basically, N.T. Wright said, don't worry about it. Uh, Caligula uh, is in the same, like on the same level when it comes to ancient sources as Jesus. This is why we were talking about Caligula as well, right? Which is like, how do you get this much education in this and still something say something like that, right? Like, if Lacona says that he was he was only made aware of these extra sources after uh, Matt Ferguson wrote the article. How did he get a PhD in ancient history? Because it's not like some ancient, like obscure uh, inscription somewhere in Asia Minor. It's Horace uh, or 
Cornelius Nepos, you know, these are the people that you are given to read when you are getting graduate graduate level training in ancient history, right? So yeah, this is this is why uh, us three guys are doing this because there are people still on Facebook using this apologetic, saying things that are wrong. And here's an opportunity for Christians listening to just you'll get a lot of um, bonus points from not only uh, non Christians but even um, um, in your own in group. You can say, "Look, guys, you got to stop this." N.T. Wright is one of these guys. <laughs> um, and what Camille was just saying, uh, we have the evidence right here. Thank you, Jose. I think the answer is that Price and Carrier are not well qualified. New Testament qual scholars, like even that alone, Price and Carrier are not qualified scholars. They, Price has two PhDs in the field. And Hopper, too. I have actually never heard of heard of any of them. N.T. Wright, you've never heard of... Is, is this possible that he hasn't heard of these guys? Not one of them. But in any case, the evidence for Jesus is much wider than Jos the Josephus passage. Jesus is well established as as a figure of history, as is, say, the emperor Caligula. Wrong. N.T. Wright, you're wrong. His near contemporary. It is frustrating when people write rubbish. And Yes, I agree. It's frustrating when people write rubbish like you, N.T. Wright, right here, right now. And ordinary folk are deceived, but this happens all the time, and one cannot always be correcting bad history, blah, blah, blah. Um, and here's another quote from N.T. Wright. Uh, second, I have taken for granted that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Now, again, what Camille said, I'm just going to second. This is not about whether or not Jesus existed or not. This is about comparing sources to other ancient uh, figures. Some writers feel the need to justify this assumption at length against people who try from time to time to deny it. It would be easier, frankly, to believe that Tiberius Caesar, Jesus' contemporary, was a figment of the imagination that to believe that there was never such a person as Jesus. Those who persist in denying this obvious point will probably not want to read a book like this anyway. Uh, Cam, do you remember what book this quote's from? Oh, um, I, I forgot to source it. Uh, I'll, I'll get a few. Um, it's not the resurrection of Jesus because I know that he has one like that. Uh, you, you know, you know what, you, what I just realized. So here, anti Wright is basically saying, "Look, if you're a mythicist, you're not going to be willing to hear what I have to say." But we actually have an email in which he says that he's never heard of. Robert Price or Richard Carrier, which makes me think like if you don't know them and you don't don't know their work, you're not really engaging with their arguments, right? Like I For would sure. want people who criticize them and disagree with them to at least know who they are and what they're saying, right? Even if I'm not a mythicist myself. So yeah, yeah. it's really weird. So um Oh, so one thing to note is that I'm sure N.T. Wright did not know that that email exchange was going to be, to, like, put in the public space. But regardless, he shouldn't really be making those claims in private anyway. Um, it was specifically from Jesus and the Victory of God. That was the book name. Okay, thanks. And um, I just wanted to have that for the record. I, I want to... Um... I just uh, check in my notes. There's one thing I want to talk about with that 150 year thing. Matthew Ferguson makes a great point. Consider that an analogy with Joseph Smith, the guy who started Mormonism. Most of us today are familiar with Joseph Smith over 150 years after his death. But how many are familiar with the, his contemporary U.S. President John Tyler? <laughs> Did, I know uh, Camille and, and Cam because they're not American. Actually, you're not, there's no Americans on this, in this room right now in this live stream. Uh, I wasn't even aware of John Tyler, at least maybe in the back recesses of my mind. But he's making a great point that um, if you go farther out about Jesus, that's when the religion started taking off. And so therefore, and that's the time when people start forgetting about political leaders. So for the same reason, we most people have no clue about the life of John Tyler, uh, the 10th US president of the United States, I looked it up before this show. Um, for the same reason, we a lot of there might be fewer writings about um, Tiberius, not yeah Tiberius, uh, 150 in the second century. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that in. Now I want to also throw in um, how this misinformation is just rampant amongst uh, evangelicals, and that email, um, not email, the Facebook post. Let's see if I can find it is why we're doing this. So was it you, Cam? You were on some Facebook group? Do you want to say which group it was? 
Yeah, um, I won't say which group it was, but <laughs> okay. So anyhow, there's a Facebook group. I blocked. Up you don't want to know what dark recesses of the internet I've been on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is just a. a um, a guy on a Facebook group saying a couple things I find helpful. We have more sources for Jesus existence than the Roman emperor at the time. That's false. We have a lot of arguments on who Jesus really was from the bunch of different groups, Christians, Jews, uh, agnostics. Uh, that's kind of true. We have sources from the gospels and early church fathers stating a lot of things we know about this Jesus, where he was born uh, and so forth. We have opponents of Christianity, not arguing Jesus existence, all the followers. Okay, this, so he basically is talking about myth, mythicism here. But then someone asked him, what do you mean about point one? We have more sources for Jesus' existence than the Roman emperor at the time. And this was this person's response. Uh, we have four main sources for each. For Jesus, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Q, maybe. Dated anywhere between there. The earliest incomplete copies there. But for Tiberius Caesar, we, our main sources are this, 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 this. Uh, dated... Um, here. And so basically what he's doing, what this person on Facebook is doing is he's spewing stuff he's probably read from guys like this, Norman Geisler in, uh, which book was it? Yeah, and, and Frank Turek, yeah. the co -author. So if you're a Christian and you have um, Norman Geisler and Frank Turek's book, I, uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, you're getting this misinformation into your head. And if you are talking to knowledgeable guys like Cam and Camille on Facebook, and if you actually care for a second to research what they're saying, you're going to find out, oops, these guys are right, and Frank Turek and Norman Geisler are wrong. And it's going to make you look and feel bad. But you could be a hero if you flip it around and do this with your what we're doing, do it with your Christian friends. Yeah, and I think that this goes, uh, the the evidence of a variety of apologists repeating this apologetic, I think it, um, it comes back to your claim, Doug, about being desirous for certain things to be true because they support, um, you know, what would be useful to you. And I think it is the case that uh, a variety of folks here, even like well-respected people within the Christian community, are just not checking these things that are really easily checked. Like, it's actually really easy to check the sources for Tiberius. Like, you, you can do, a ver I mean, of course, it's easier now because there are popular blog articles <laughs> disputing things. But you can go get a biography of Tiberius written by a historian, and you can find in that biography, um, you know, busts, coins, um, references to a variety of um, uh uh, early references to him and so it really all it takes is going and getting a biography of the figure and the same thing is kind of true of alexander the great you can go get that and a biography of that and you can find out that you know it's not as simple as these people are presenting it so if you're a christian and you have uh in your library a book called the compelling evidence for god in the bible by douglas jacoby uh, he has false information in there because he's using the 1042 apologetic. If you have in your study a book called Stand Your Ground by Dean Hardy, again, false information in it. If you have the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, false information. Uh, what else do I have here? Yeah, I mean, this is really bothering me because like, if I bought a book and this was in it, I would be really considering like what else is false, right? This really lowers my standard, like it really lowers my confidence in other things that, for example, Mike Lacona has to say. I mean, he probably knows more about Christianity than he knows about like ancient history, Greek or Roman, right? But come on, like this is really basic stuff. Tiberius was the emperor. He wasn't some obscure figure, right? Okay, this is the last slide I have, guys. Um, but this, Camille, you made, right? Or did you get this from yeah. Matthew? Yeah, I mean, if, if I knew that uh, you were going to show this, I would fill in some of the blanks. But yeah, I think we do have contemporary statues of Caesar. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's, that's fine. I don't feel embarrassed. But I thought this was a brilliant, brilliant chart. And so very quickly, you can have these ancient figures like Jesus, Alexander the Great, Caligula, Spartacus, Hannibal, Caesar, Tiberius, and Socrates. And you can go through these columns and say, do we have contemporary sources? 
No for Jesus, yes for the rest. Early sources, yes, if you count you know, people who were alive when the person was alive. We have Paul for Jesus, if it's just one. Uh, contemporary statues, no, but for a lot of these, yes, we have statues. Uh, contemporary coins, no for Jesus, of course, but yes for a lot of these guys. Contemporary inscriptions, no for Jesus, of course, but yes for a lot of these. Do we have their own writings? Jesus never wrote anything, except on the sand that one time, I think, about the Samaritan woman. Um, but with a lot of these other figures, we have what they actually wrote with their own hand. That's pretty amazing. Well, in, sometimes in quotation, but so yeah, I think I think here I only included included like actual writings, uh, like on tablets and inscriptions and stuff like that. Because in some cases, like for Alexander the Great, for example, the way how these ancient rulers operate w was that they issued policy basically in a form of a letter. So they would write a letter to a city, giving them privileges and stuff like that. And the city would obviously engrave the letter on uh, on a, a rock, basically, but they would create an inscription, and that inscription still exists today. So we actually know, like a letter that, if not Alexander himself, it was at least composed uh, by someone who did like official administration for him. And you know what's <laughs> great about this? You know how there is a lot of debates about the manuscript would obviously in, and like how many errors are there in first in early uh, New Testament manuscripts where these documents are actually the originals. They are the orthographs, right? So w when we, for example, have uh, a papyri of a letter that uses Tiberius's name for dating, that's the original. We don't have copies of copies. So if we had something like that mentioning the name of Jesus, that would be amazing. It would, but um, there is this uh, person, M10 Show 1, and I just want to do, do their co comment justice. They say, uh, that's not a fair table. Jesus wasn't a political or military leader. There wouldn't be much archaeology for Jesus. And that is precisely right. We, it's the, the table isn't presented in order to suggest that we would expect these things for Jesus. Um, it's in order to uh, rebut the claim that the sources for Jesus are as good as what they are for these other figures, which is this claim that commonly gets made. So you're totally right. We don't don't expect these sources, or at least on the assumption that the of a historical Jesus, not a Christ of faith. But the people doing this 1042 apologetic, they don't, they we're not talking about the historical Jesus, we're talking about the, the Christ. So in their heads, the Christ um, was far, did far greater things than Tiberius. Yeah, well, so he did uh, miracles and public um, uh, display. He was known uh, like across his news, uh, news of him spread across the world. Um, I think like uh, Luke or Mark, I can't remember which one says that news of him spread all across Syria. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can recall Camille or Doug, but um, there's, there's two of them, obviously... one on Sir one Syria, one Judea. Yeah, at his death. You know, there were these, as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, these apocalyptic events going on in Jerusalem. Um, you know, of course, a lot of the people in the stream probably don't believe that those things are true. But, um, you know, if you do take the Gospels as representing history, then those things we would expect to find some evidence for at least, and we don't. So the Christ of faith we might expect more evidence comparable to Tiberius. But yes, the historical Jesus, who was largely a, um, a nobody, yes, we don't expect this kind of evidence. Uh, yes, Ken Scaletta, the table isn't supposed to disprove the existence of Jesus, just to debunk the claim that we have more info about him than Tiberius, or even equal. It's not, it's not close. Um, that apologetic about Tiberius and, and Jesus, that Habermas, Lycona, Lacona has admitted that it's it has false information in it, um, but Habermas hasn't. It, that what, what we're saying is you can be a hero as a Christ, young Christian, telling your Christian friends stop it, stop it with this. Uh, we have as much for uh, Jesus as Tiberius because you don't. Not yeah, and so it, like a good heuristic is that you should almost have a like a 
a, <laughs> a, a BS detector. If you hear somebody claiming that we have better evidence for Jesus than some kind of emperor or political leader or, or that kind of thing, it's probably not true. Um, and you should just kind of doubt that claim to begin with. And that's not necessarily because the evidence for Jesus is bad. It's just because these people just had such a huge impression directly on history because of their prominence. Isn't the evidence for Jesus bad, Cam? I think it is, but there are historicists who think that it's quite good. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, de it depends what exactly are you asking, right? Like, is it good enough for thinking that he existed as a person? I think yes. But yeah. is it enough to think that he probably, I don't know, turned water into wine or like fed 3,000 people? Probably no. Uh, what are the non-Christian sources claimed besides Josephus for Jesus, Raf Raphael is asking? Uh, I have that in the chart. Um, but you guys know off the top of your head? Claim, yeah, they claim Tacitus, Phlegon, um, they can't, Pliny the Younger, um, uh, the Suetonius, Suetonius and, and, uh, and then Lucianos around 160. Uh, so obviously, uh, some of these sources are disputed, like there are Oh, Saint Richard Carrier, for example, disputes uh, Tacitus, right? Uh, there is an interesting article where textual critics actually used like computer assisted textual criticisms. Like, they are basically now computer programs that you can train to evaluate. Uh, literary styles and stuff like that. They can basically do the work that 100 years ago you had to have a, a German guy spending 30 years going through the sources. And they, they took that program and they ran the letters of uh, Pliny talking about Jesus or talking about Christ. H doesn't mention Jesus uh, through that. And it found out that it wasn't actually written by Pliny. So now there is this debate whether even that evidence is authentic or whether that's a letter that was actually written by Christians later. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even if we just go by the undisputed sources, then I think it's, uh, it's uh, not terrible. Yeah, and Ma I think Matthew Ferguson gets into a fair bit of detail on this, but me listing out those uh, folks before, those sources, is not to say that I agree that they actually do provide um, you know, un unproblematic references to Jesus. For example, um, if I recall correctly, Suetonius really only mentions Christians. Um, I don't think that he mentions actually Jesus. Yeah, he, he, about that, yeah he mentions Christians, and then he mentions Crestos, uh, yeah. who in connection with uh, the Jews in Rome, not with Christians. So there is this hypothesis that around the same time as... Uh, I think Claudius, there was a guy named Crestos, who is also uh, attested by Cassius Dio, who was some uh, like a Jewish instigator, and he incited some stuff, and that led to the expulsion of uh, of Jews from Rome. Which, if this is the case, it really complicates stuff because it just happened. The it just happens to be the case that there was a guy who had a name that's kind of similar to uh, to Jesus. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think that the Phlegon reference you guys is are, really you, like, you guys are getting too uh, deep. Yeah. yeah, you guys are getting yeah, too yeah, deep. Yeah, sure. Uh, David B is asking, uh, so 60 second answers. Uh, David B is asking, does the supernatural claim entailed in the minimal facts not reduce the plausibility of otherwise mundane claims? So David B is asking, the fact that uh, guys like Habermas talk about the minimal facts, and but it's right next to these claims of the fantastical, should we not reduce the plausibility of even the mundane claims? David B., the answer is yes, you should reduce the plausibility of the otherwise mundane claims. And here's why. A uh, Christian person listening who are disagreeing with me right now, uh, you're sitting next to me on a bench, park bench. You don't know who I am. You've never seen me before. We're sitting, I'm sitting next to you on a bench. I look you in the eyes and I say, I walked on water last week. And you kind of just look at me. Okay. And then I say to you, I rose a person from the dead uh, a month ago. And you kind of, you know, you're starting to shift away from me. And then I say, oh, I divided loaves and fishes and fed uh, 5,000 people. And then I say, the last thing I tell you is, I own a Lexus car. 
<laughs> now, I could own a Lexus car, but at that point, aren't, haven't you written me off <laughs> and said, you know what? Uh, I can't really trust whatever this guy says. This guy's nutso, um, and I'm not going to give him the time of day. This is basically Robert Price's argument with um, Clark Kent and Superman. Clark Kent, there's nothing extraordinary about Clark Kent, but Clark Kent's uh, alter ego is Superman. Actually, the other way around. And, um, and so you can't separate those two guys. So you got to take the package deal. And if you're going to doubt one side, if you're going to doubt Clark Kent, you have to doubt Superman. If you doubt Superman, you have to doubt Clark Kent. So great question. Except for the fact that we do have uh, figures in history who we do think are historical, that we see a mythologization occurring with them such that they get a variety of claims attached to them that are similar to what we find attached to Jesus. And like one example would be somebody who is actually almost contemporary with Jesus, Apollonius of Tiana, where he gets many of the same attributes attached to him as a figure yet historians do actually think he's probably historical and his his life is recorded in philostratus's life of apollonius of tiana and um it yeah like i said it contains many of the same types of claims as what we find for jesus yeah and also um uh octavian right augustus caesar caesar augustus <laughs> Yeah, he gets claimed to have, you know, like settled the storms. I don't know if that's a metaphor, but he gets claimed to have healed people too in Philo's, I think, embassy to Gaius. Um, but as well, uh, Vespasian, um, as I think I've talked about on this channel before, in, uh, I think, uh, Cassius Dio and Suetonius and Tacitus gets claimed to have healed um, people via, like healed a blind man, I think, and a person with a withered hand, if I'm remembering correctly. So how do you think historians separate the fantastical from the real history? Just by saying by prior probability? Yeah, well, I mean, like, they start off by using broadly, like the principle of analogy. So we... Um, in historical reasoning, we have to have like some type of background context through which to evaluate the plausibility of claims. And our background context that we use is other things within history that occurred as well as things that happened in our present day. And um, which is not to say that like things can't happen that are different from what we usually see, but um, it at least is something that gives us um, graded levels of confidences before evaluating the evidence. And then the other thing is that like the object of a historian when assessing a piece of data, which is what really sources present to us, they present data. The object of the historian is to try to um, uh, give a comparison of explanations of what accounts for that data. So in the case of Vespasian, having him claimed to have performed miracles was a means by which um, propagandists uh, working under Vespasian, the Fla Flavians in particular, um, it was like a means by which they could legitimate the claim of his emperorship. And um, so there are explanations for why it is that these things would be claimed about Vespasian that don't rely on it actually having been historical fact. And when you're in a position where you have a equally good explanation of the data with a hypothesis that is usually something that happens versus an explanation that is a hypothesis that very rarely happens, then you're in a position where you can make a judgment. David B. says, just to be clear, what I mean is that even if no extraordinary claim was made explicitly, the mundane claim should not be treated as mundane if they do entail something extraordinary. I don't understand what you're saying, David. Perhaps what he's talking about is what I, and I think I got this from Robert Price, like to call the yellow brick road, where, and he may not be saying this, but I, I, I think it's like a, a nice analogy. Um, there is this argument uh, 
uh, if the Emerald City doesn't exist, then where is it that the Yellow Brick Road leads? And like, you know, obviously the mistake here is that the Yellow Brick Road is being taken to be something that's real and it's being used as an argument for the Emerald City where the Yellow Brick Road is really like part of the Wizard of Oz story. And so what someone might like to say is that when you're taking the narrative details in the Gospel of Mark leading up to the resurrection account too seriously, you're sort of falling into the mistake of playing on the yellow brick road, so to speak. Okay, someone wants us to explain Genesis 5 for five bucks. <laughs> uh, it's a trap! But I'm curious uh, what they're talking about. My guess, uh, the question I think earlier was about the Gospels found in Genesis 5. Oh, yes, the history of Adam's family. Yeah. Explain whenever, if you're a Christian listening, if whenever you you say the words, explain to me. <laughs> uh, you you need to look inward and say to yourself, why am I asking this question? Explain to me X, and then you fill in the blank what X is. And it's, I get this sense that Christians think that, who do this. They think that if you can't explain it, that means that whatever you're espousing or whatever you believe is true or likely to be true. And that, that doesn't follow. And what's in, what's in Genesis 5? It's, it's um, uh, genealogies or? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I know who this person is who's asking the question. I, th I think it starts with the Tower of Babel, then there is a genealogy, and then it starts the story of Abraham. Am I wrong? Yeah, and I think the question is, um, this: how does Genesis five relate to the gospel? Or if the gospel, if this none of this was true, how can um, is, is the in the gospel of Luke is this genealogy found? Oh, no, it's just the genealogy. I was uh, probably or, confusing it with some other chapter. Um, yeah, I don't understand what the question is. Uh, yeah, yeah my, neither do I. My guess is it's uh, for the person who asked the question, um, Jay, is it? Uh, if you're asking how can the geneal ge genealogies be the same in the Gospels, well, they knew the Old Testament and they just penned it in. Now, I think what you're asking is, look, you can claim the Testament, use the Old Testament. How is the Gospel hidden? <laughs> but how is the Gospel hidden? Yeah, uh, Jan, sorry. Uh I think he's going to, it's, it's one of those code things that there's meanings with the names in the, within the gene, genealogy. Guitar Dog asks, why is there such weak evidence for the most important event in uh, all history? Well, uh, I think that Christian apologists, they actually really try to claim that the, they, there's very good evidence. <laughs> um, so your characterization of the evidence right out of the gate would be met with a lot of skepticism and um, from an apologist because they think the type of evidence that we have for Jesus points almost deductively to the resurrection claim. Um, now, yeah, course, but on the yeah. other hand... On the other hand, you do have Christians who are fideists or presuppositionalists. Like, there are actually presuppositionalists who do videos showing how the evidential arguments for God or Jesus specifically are weak because they want to motivate you to use presuppositional apologetic uh, either uh, instead. And then there are actually Christians, including Christian scholars, who admit that there isn't enough epistemic justification for believing that the resurrection happened on the historical grounds. They just have a, a different justification. For example, they are pragmatic or they are cultural Christians or something like that. So you do can find Christian scholars who like publish in academia who say, if you think that you can establish a resurrection as a historical event, you are nuts. Like that, for example, Mike Lacona, for example, did debates with uh, Christians that actually dispute that you can establish the resurrection using the historical methods, like uh, John Dominic Crossan and others. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. There's like Christians 
quite across the spectrum on this. And there are definitely folks who think that historical methods can't get you there. Um, and instead, like the justification from uh, theist comes from revelation uh, for, you know, for the Christian believer. Um, it, in fact, like you were saying, there are some that go so far as to say that really the evidential style arguments are almost a perversion of the gospel and bordering on like heretical. <laughs> yeah, you're standing over, uh, you're standing in judgment over God, right? When you evaluate the evidence and trying to figure out like, does he exist? Ah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, those are the precepts. They don't do that. I think it's a sin to actually talk about the evidence because it puts God on trial. Yeah, there is probably something to say to that in the scriptures. Like, like if we could travel back in time and talk to Paul, I'm not sure how happy he would be with what like Mike Lacona is doing. Maybe he would say, you know, you just have to have faith. <laughs> but that's obviously controversial. Well, what do you guys like? I want to say, and I shouldn't, because this whole it kind of is different than the topic of this uh, live stream. But to me, it's just painfully clear that, like this guy named Jan in the chat, who I had to put in a timeout because he wanted to list all the meanings of all the words in the genealogy of Genesis five to show to prove that that this has to be in divine in nature to show that the gospels are true. But in my mind, I'm just perceiving this guy as Jesus. He had an experience of Jesus that he believes was from Jesus, and Jesus radically changed his life, that he believes this is what happened to him. And then afterwards, when he feels kind of like, is this really true? He finds out stuff like Genesis 5, and he puts it together. Man, yes, yes, what I believe is true. And I just... I just think this happens time and time again, that, you know, your beliefs come first, your reasons come second, and you try desperately to justify what you believe is actually true. And just like this 1042 apologetic, hey, I brought it back around. This 1042 apologetic does the exact same thing. It's Habermas and Lycona have this desirous belief that they just want this to be true. For Lycona, it was probably some miracle in his life. It's flying trash can lids. With Habermas, I don't know. And it's just like you desperately want this evidence to fit what you already believe and give you confidence that, yes, this is true. I'm not stupid for believing this stuff. I think this is what's going on. Yeah, is the claim that uh, the genealogy is somehow talk about Jesus when you like do some fancy stuff with it yeah when you look at the because meetings. if 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 that's the case they probably also talk about the assassination of JFK if you do enough work with on those right like yeah, you, you can get if you I, can get a lot of yeah if i was a betting man i'd bet that this guy jan uh uh also is a 911 truther and that sort of thing captain fart liquor asks uh, why were some Roman emperors deified and some not? That's a good question. Yeah, because those that were not are probably like not very good people. Because it, it, it started with Augustus, then I think Tiberius was deified. Then I think, I mean, the, not an emperor, but I think like Julius Caesar was. Yeah, it, oh, yeah, that's that's actually a good point. Yeah, so I think I think it goes up to Claudius, except Caligula wasn't, and then Vespasian and Titus were deified, and that, then I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, if the question is why they were deified in the first place. It, it was kind of assumed that this was like a power move, that it was a way for them to cement their power. But actually now it looks like more and more this uh, idea that the emperor as a god was more like a bottom up, like a ground up uh, social event, like social phenomena, where we have evidences of people, especially in the Eastern parts of the empire, empire that were kind of setting up, temple, setting up temples to the emperors 
particularly to Augustus fairly early on without him necessarily like ordering it. It was just a no normal mode of um, of uh, showing uh, your loyalty to whoever happens to be in power at any given time. Because we have pe obviously many people who were considered divine before then and were ruling over the same people. And then if the question is why these particular emperors were not deified, then it's usually because they were not considered like a very good people at the time. For, for example, Caligula was assassinated by a conspiracy that involved the aristocracy. So the people who killed him are obviously not then going to vote on him being a god, right? Uh, which is interesting because Claudius probably was uh, mentally ill or, or like mentally handicapped but he still he still was deified after he died and he was probably also assassinated so it's uh, it's probably a bit more complicated than that yeah and like you're saying in the east there was a lot of deification of um of like kings and uh like for for example um like oh the the pharaoh the pharaohs are, are good examples or even like alexander the great and um yeah there's lots of examples prior to the romans doing it yes ken scaleta um octavian was called as um savior to the romans uh he brought the good news the gospel to the people <laughs> There's actually a great uh, meme, uh, so a Roman poet called Virgil, who worked uh, before Jesus, well, I think he died when Jesus was a teenager. He wrote a poem celebrating Augustus as a son of God. And it actually used this uh, language, which is so similar to how Christians later talked about Jesus, that in the fourth century, they became convinced that even though Virgil was a pagan and he lived before jesus this poem is actually a prophecy about jesus so they started like celebrating virgil as a kind of this noble poet who just happened to live before the gospel but he was actually secretly being fed prophecies by the christian god and he was kind of elevated to a very high status among uh, in christian literature this is for example why he's depicted as the companion to that in the Divine Comedy. Uh, so yeah, uh, Christians were so good in finding Jesus in the Bible that they actually started seeing him even in pagan literature. Uh, Am83330, $10 donation, thank you so much. What's the earliest reference of Christians saying they could never lose their salvation, once saved, always saved, or eternal security? Oh, I know the answer to this question. You're, you're in luck. The earliest reference that I know of is in the Gospel of John, where it says no one can take the uh, oh no one can remove take the, the person from the father's hand what what's the you remember cam is it is, i think it's in the gospel of john don't make me look it up <laughs> <laughs> that's all in my head i don't know <laughs> but that's it's a good question but that's the um that's the go-to verse for most people who believe once saved always saved uh, is that... and, and but it would be interesting to look up when this was actually first uh, formulated as a point in theology, right? Because that could go way late. Uh, maybe Augustine, because I know a lot of later Protestants like Martin Luther based some of their stuff on Augustine, but I'm not that familiar with that. Um, so maybe it was this one that you're talking about, Doug, John three fifteen to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten no, son. No, no. That, no, hold on. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Um, yeah. No, that's maybe not that one. No, no, they, right. well, no one, no one can take the child out of the phase. He who believes in him is not condemned. I don't know. Anyway. Someone in but the live stream chat, look it up. It's the li it's taking the uh, out of the father's hand. It, the word hand is in it. Right. Camille, back to what you're saying before, it reminded me of the fact that Justin Martyr um, says that, you know, that Jesus is much like those who the Greeks um, follow. And in fact, eventually, this 
develops into a full-blown apologetic that says the reason why it is the case that Jesus was like Heracles and all of these other figures is the fact that um, prior to Jesus's existence, the devil had effectively been like, you know, whispering these things into the ears of the variety of people who came to believe them. <laughs> um, yeah. So N.T. Wright's primarily a preacher not a scholar I, I can buy that db cisco thanks for the donation mark 16 6 he got up is the unbiased translation from the greek not he is risen oh ah, interesting he got up <laughs> jesus was in the tomb and he got up yeah i don't i don't, I don't really agree with that but he, he got up and went to heaven like up to heaven yeah like i, I mean i think well to me at least it's clear that the um, empty tomb and the end of the Gospel of Mark from 16 through to verse 15 is indicating that Jesus has come back alive again, which is why the angel or like the young man says, go meet him in Galilee where he said that he would meet you. Uh, I think that like you're trying to make a rationalist. I mean, I don't know what D.B. Cisco is trying to say about that, but I think it's splitting hairs. Thank you, stalemate IB. John 10, 28 to 30 is what I was talking about, I think. Uh, nobody could take uh, the child out of the father's hand. Um, Rembrandt, but the Bible also says that Jesus will not recognize many who claim to believe. That's true. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto thee, you cast demons in my name, but I say to you, I never knew you. Something like that. I think it's in the Gospel of Mark. And so there's surprise, surprise verses in the Bible that's show that nothing can take you out of the Father's hand, that you're once saved, always saved, and yet uh, you can think that you're saved and maybe not. Mountain Show 1 says, Pine Creek, when will Jesus appear to Mike Winger and say, thanks, buddy, but how about you set this out going forward? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, I've noticed that Mike Winger is doing more how should I say theological type live streams and, or content rather than showing that the Bible's true? Have you guys noticed that? Anyhow. Yeah. Um, so back to DB Cisco, like he wants to know why. Um, I, I'm not saying that, for example, if that word was used in another context, uh, that didn't pertain to anything like resurrection, that it couldn't mean to get up or to stand up or something like that. But I'm meaning that in this context, it clearly means that he uh, resurrected. And in fact, if you go and read the book by John uh, John Cook, um, he gives an analysis of this particular word um, in prior literature that defends the position that this would mean for the Mark and author that he was trying to signal that Jesus did resurrect or, you know, come back to life. Yeah, in ancient Greek, uh, generally words have a much wider semantic range which means that if you are really like pedantic about it, you can take the word and show that it could mean uh, something completely different or something like very mundane. But you then have to like look at the context to kind of know what the particular author is saying at the particular time, right? I, I think in the Gospel of Mark, it's uh, pretty clear what's uh, supposed to be going on, even if the word can just mean, you know, to got up early in the morning. Uh, this question is for you, I think, uh, Camille. Uh, Captain Liquor of Farts asks, <laughs> uh, okay, you're in a time machine. You go back to Palestine 2,000 years ago. You're walking around in Palestine. How, out of 100 people, how many of them will be speaking Greek? Yeah, I think it depends on where exactly you would be, because I think the consensus is that the larger the population center, the more more Hellenized it was. So, uh, for example, in Decapolis, which uh, I think it's usually considered to be in Palestine, that was much more Hellenized. There is also a debate about Galilee specifically, like how Hellenized it was. But because, for example, some Christians want to make an, the argument that it was very heavily Hellenized, therefore we are, uh, re it's reasonable to believe that the traditional authors of the Gospels would be able to compose uh, the Gospels in Greek. 
But obviously, if you are arguing that that you are, then you are much more open to the counter move of saying that if the uh, area was very largely Hellenized, there might have been Hellenistic influences on Christianity. Yes. For example, depicting the yeah, the, the, for example, the Jesus's birth is very similar to how births of other people uh, who have divine. Um, parents basically or where the father is god uh, are depicted in greek sources right and it's relatively dissimilar to previous jewish uh, literature uh but but i think uh, galilee is was like a really uh, rural uh, rural area where there was basically nothing going on right like there was no, there's no yeah. evidence Let of me, writing can i uh, can i can i, I, wanna... I think like, to give a bit more context here though oh you you, you can go doug I just want to paraphrase the brilliant thing that Camille just said. He basically said, look, you can't be a Christian and say, oh, yeah, yeah, these poor poor fishermen, they wrote the Gospels in, in Greek because, um, yeah, they were Hellenized, the, the Greek influence. That makes sense. And at the same time say, but no, there was no Greek influences that on certain narratives in the Gospels. They, 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 no, they quarantined themselves off from, from all Hellenistic influences when they're writing the narrative. But they were influenced enough to actually know read and write greek yeah so sometimes it's really absurd like when you point out the similarities between logos in philo and logos in the gospel of john it's obviously very similar theological concepts i i've i've had christians telling me that no philo he got the logos from plato he lived in alexandria which was obviously like a, a very hellenized city uh, so that's just coming from Timaeus and whatnot. But then the exact same thing, basically, in the Gospel of John. That's not a product of Hellenistic influence. That's in the Gospel because it's actually true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Go ahead, to Cam. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, so like in Galilee, there w there were places at the time of Jesus, like uh, Tiberias, um, which was a a city that was from my recollection built and named after Tiberius um, by the Herods and that place was like very Hellenized and was set up as like a normal Greek city and then like on the upper on the opposite side of um, Lake Tiberius there were or oh, and down to the south like there were a bunch of uh, uh, like Greek cities as well um, and yeah so i think that there are arguments to be made that some parts of galilee at least had like greek spe greek speaking people and like hellenistic influence and one thing that to be aware is that like uh this whole region was like uh pretty frequented by travelers and stuff going from the more hellenized uh egypt and alexandria and cyrene and places like this uh coming to other areas of the mediterranean so there was a lot of like uh, you know other ideas that were coming through this place at the time of the gospels okay any more questions we're going to wrap it up so camille can start his day his birthday 33 years old it was actually yesterday but it's still 11th uh where your guys at right that's right right <laughs> oh the interest talking about birthdays we know like you said earlier we know the exact day of when tiberius was born and died but we don't know when jesus was born or when he died we, we don't even know the year that Jesus was born. We well, actually get conflicting or accounts. Or some, some Christians would give you the exact date and year. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. We won't say who, bro, bro. <laughs> <laughs> if I was to leave the stream with anything, and I certainly know that it's incredibly unlikely Mike Lacano would be watching this, but... Uh, I think it's the responsibility of these apologists to actually educate the people who follow them and respect them when they make mistakes in these areas. And I don't think it's sufficient to say, 
my bad, maybe my claim about Tiberius was wrong. You need to actually actively educate people who respect you because the reality is, is that Doug, myself and Camille are not going to be able to affect enough people who are Christians who end up believing this stuff because we just don't have that kind of reach in the Christian community. So my plea is, I know as ridiculous as it sounds, please like actually write articles on this stuff to correct these um, you know, misunderstandings about our sources of history. Well, did you like the way I kind of pushed this, Cam? I, I'm trying to appeal to the Christian sense of ego and trying to look cool. Like, don't you want to be a cool kid and show up your Christian friends and say, no, actually, that's not right. Let's get it right, guys. We, we ha we're the bastions of truth here. Let's get this right. Yeah, I, I always want Christians to make as good arguments as possible because it's always frustrating when I read uh, some book like of apologetics or something like that and I just see something that's patently false because it makes me anxious about what else am I reading that's not correct and I'm just not able to tell, right? The music has started, guys. You can't hear it, but the audience can. So that was uh, roughly two hours and... No, it's under two hours. You guys want to keep going? We are getting bet. We are getting better at this. Yeah, we only needed one... Uh, uh, one comment saying keep your answers under 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys were going a little too far there for a second. Raphael Block, Steelman, yes. My open mind. Thanks for the British pounds. God's coming to Earth as humans, Greek or other. God's coming to Earth as humans, Greek or other. I'm gonna go with other. Who's that little child? Yeah, I, I don't have a kitty, so I have to go with a child. Just, these are the two things uh, that get you a lot of views on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Babies and puppies. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna poof you guys out one at a time. Poof. Poof. The floating duck. I, uh, where did Doug find this terrible music? Ken, I found this music at a yard sale. Got it cheap. As always, my apologies to, to Gary Habermas, who was scheduled to come on to defend the 1042 Apologetic, but we ran out of time. Oof. Good to see you, see you here, Mind Onion. Have a good night. Until next time.